It is now my pleasure to introduce to you our first speaker, Dr. Richard Houghton. Dr. Houghton is senior scientist at the Woods Hole Research Center in Falmouth, Massachusetts. For more than 40 years, he has studied the interactions among land management, the global carbon cycle, and climate change, participating in most of the IPCC, or the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, including assessing uh, assessments of climate change, including most recently the 2019 IPCC Special Report on Climate Change and Land. His expertise is in estimating the annual sources and sinks of carbon that result from land use or management and the potential for additional sources or sinks depending on management and climate change. His estimates combine information on the global distribution of land use, including satellite data with an understanding of the changes in vegetation and soil that result from management. Dr. Houghton received his PhD in ecology from Stony Brook University prior to joining the Woods Hole Research Center in 1987. He worked as a research scientist at Brookhaven National Library, Laboratory in New York and at Maine, and the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. He served as a visiting senior scientist at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. for two years. The title of his talk is Potential for Limiting Climate Change. I welcome Dr. Houghton. I'm pleased to be here, invited to this. Um, I, I hope to be able to say something reasonable about solutions. Um, let me bring up some slides. I'm going to uh, assume everything's working and um, I, I'm going to speak about solutions, a very limited set of solutions for climate stabilization and I, and I too will refer to the current COVID-19 crisis because there are a few parallels between that and climate change. Um, I'm just going to have four parts to this talk. Uh, I'm going to briefly discuss the problem, assume that most everyone's familiar with that, talk about what the need is to, to get at that problem, and then solutions for a summary. Um, <clears throat> my own perspective, or bias, if you will, is, is from the perspective of the global carbon cycle, particularly land, land management, terrestrial ecosystem. Um, and the problem, of course, is the climate is already changing and, and that will continue for some time. There are heat waves, droughts and storms, fires, floods, sea level rise, and so on. We're familiar with the list. Um, and all of the all of the consequences so far, all of these changes are the result of a warming that's been less than one degree centigrade. That's roughly one degree one degree so far. Um, it raises the question whether 1.5 degrees C or two degrees C is is too much. Um, just to to point out one similarity between the climate disruption and COVID-19, COVID despite what it says here, uh, it's it's hard to grasp that this is a this is a quote from uh, my director, President. It's hard to grasp that climate change could happen because we've never seen anything like it, and yet COVID-19 is an example of the unimaginable happening. It's interesting, it's a sort of an irony or a paradox. It's predictable, it was predictable, is predictable, but unimaginable. So the need is, is really pretty fundamental. We need to change the trajectory of, of emissions of greenhouse gases, particularly carbon dioxide. We have to transition from fossil fuels to renewable forms of energy, for example, solar and wind. And to do this, we'll need negative emissions, which I will speak somewhat more about. 
here's a slide that has lots of um, lots of active, lots of information in it. Let me just draw your attention to the two red vertical lines from 2018 to 2050. That's when we be, should be paying attention to reducing emissions. And we have to do that. Well, when I first saw this slide, it really brought home to me the urgency. If, if you look at the left, you see historical emissions of carbon dioxide going upward. If that trend continues, you have the blue line up, up to the right. The uh, pledges and the national dis decisions National de declarations for emissions. Uh, the pledges already from countries will bring it down somewhat, but they're no, no not a, not anywhere enough, enough. But you can see that if you are going, if we are in, indeed serious about staying below two degrees or not exceeding one and 1.5 degrees C, then we have to immediately start reducing those emissions, and. Uh, it's going to be hard to do that without what we call negative emissions. In other words, we can use, we can, what, what do we have that will take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere instead of releasing it? Professor Houghton, I'm sorry to interrupt. We can't see the slides. Can't see the slides. Okay. No. Let me, it, can you see them now? No, no, I think if you come into the share content button along the bottom, uh, okay, I'll come back to that. Shared content. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no. It, <laughs> I should. Uh, okay, there's shared. Uh, Microsoft, probably this is it, the one. Yes? That's great. We can see them now. Oh, sorry about that. If That's okay. <laughs> can, do you. Uh, okay. Perfect. Well, let me. Um, uh, I don't. I don't want to repeat what what I've said, but I will back up a little bit and just talk about the 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 problem we're aware of. The changes already in the physical climate. Uh, it's hard really to grasp what climate change is because we've never seen anything like it. Yet COVID nineteen is an example of the unimaginable. So it raises this paradox of things that are predictable scientifically, but yet unimaginable. Uh, and so what we need to do is really change the trajectory of emissions of greenhouse gases, transition from fossil to renewables. And to do this, we'll need negative emissions. You can see on this chart or on this graph, uh, on the left axis, zero, where meaning no emissions. And, and all of these lines, represent scenarios of possible futures where the blue the blue lines are those most uh, strenuous their attempts to get at uh, a temperature rise of, of 1.5 degrees and no more and you can see that by about 2035 or 2040 or or afterwards most of those scenarios require that we take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and I'll talk about some ways to do that. You can see uh, in that in that interval between 2018 and 2050, and that 2018 was when this study was done by Roe et al. The um, you can see that for a two degree limit, there's more leniency in terms of reducing emissions, but you can still see how th they must be coming down very soon after. 2020. I should say one other thing. In 2019, the emissions were still higher than they had been ever before globally. In 2020, it's very likely the emissions will be coming down, will be lower than than the last several years, but uh, but not for the reasons that we've chosen, just because of the COVID-19 shutdown of lots of energy use. Uh, whether we rebound or not, there have been temporary reductions in the past, but we've always rebounded from those and 
gone up with ever larger and larger emissions. Um, okay. <clears throat> Okay, so I want to say, want to, this is a quote, that global warming is roughly proportional to the total amount of carbon dioxide released into the atmosphere. And that's a, that's a scientific understanding, and it means that at any point in time, for example, 2018, 2020, we can say how much more carbon can be emitted if, we, if we're really serious about staying less than one 0.5 degree warming or a 2 degree warming. <clears throat> uh, and to have a 67% chance, but a two third chance of not exceeding a warming of 1.5 degrees C, the total emissions of carbon dioxide must not be 115 petagrams of carbon. I'm going to use this unit throughout. Petagrams of carbon is also a billion metric tons. It's 10 to the 15th gram. But people use gigatons and petagrams as this sort of monstrous unit. But nevertheless, question is uh, just <laughs> how big is 115 petagrams? What does that relate to? Well, the total emissions of carbon in just one year, 2018, the last year we have data for, the emissions were 11.5 petagrams of carbon per year. 10 of those were from fossil fuel burning, 1.5 were from land management, think of largely deforestation, forest degradation. So at that rate, the allowable will be used up in, in 10 years. And that, that's hence, hence the urgency, that gives you a, a sense of what 115 petagrams of carbon how quickly they'll be used up at current rates. If we were to aim for a two degree warming, then we get a few few more years, maybe 20 years, 20 to 30, but it's still need to turn around fast. We probably can't get off fossil fuels that quickly and hence the need for ways to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. We could of course overshoot 115 petagrams, and then count on negative emissions later on to get the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere back down to 350 or 450 parts per million, something which would stabilize the climate eventually, although the climate will continue to warm for some years. And here's, this is again that same slide showing the need for abrupt reduction in emissions that eventually not only go to zero, but actually take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. All right, as I said, we could overshoot, but the worry with overshooting is that there are tipping points in, in the carbon cycle, if you will, in, in the carbon carbon climate interactions and the warming could possibly cause additional emissions. For example, thawing of permafrost. Permafrost is frozen soils in, in the northern latitudes, in boreal forests, in Arctic um, tundra. And, and those soils are rich in carbon. So if we were to thaw out the permafrost, we would likely make those frozen deposits of organic matter more, well, we would make them accessible to decomposition or decay, and that releases more carbon dioxide and methane. And, and, and any additional emissions of carbon, of course, cut into that 115 petagrams that's allowed to stay below 1.5 degrees. Similarly, diebacks in tropical forests because of warming, because of droughts, will increase the emissions of carbon. And those are things we don't have much control over except through um, mitigating climate change in the first place. Well, here are a couple of other examples of what 115 relates to. I mentioned under number one here that how that how quickly that goes away in just 10 years of, of of the emissions at, at rates of 2018. It's interesting to look at how much is in the 
as much as in the atmosphere now is about 100 and sorry 860 petagrams of carbon in the atmosphere at the start of the industrial revolution it was more like 600 so we've put in 260 petagrams of carbon more than the 115 that we have left as allowable the known fossil fuel reserves are, are on the order of a thousand quite a bit more than we want to emit the, the amount in vegetation and soils on land are on the order of 1,600. And they put in there the, num the amount of carbon in, in people alive today, just to show you the contrast. And I mentioned permafrost, 1,500 petagrams of carbon there, which, which would not all be released at once, but even at tens of petagrams, it, it certainly swamps the allowable. So that's a big, big worry if you la allow the warming to continue thawing permafrost. And just for another comparison, the total amount of carbon emitted to the atmosphere from fossil fuel use ever is on the order of 500 petagrams. From land management, long, long thousands of years, which has accelerated in recent years, but a total of about 450. And again, that's all related to the, the 115 allowable. So timing is really important now. Delays have future consequences. They have consequences for the climate effects themselves, but also making, making solutions much more difficult. If we had started, for example, a few decades ago, we would have, when the emissions were about a third or so of what they are now, we would have had much more time and the reductions would not have been so great. Timing makes this urgent. All right, so let me speak a little bit about the possible solutions. And again, this is from mostly from the perspective of somebody who works with, with land and carbon. Uh, there are three, I'm going to go through three in particular and then mention several others afterwards, but the three that have to do with forest management are, number one, stop deforestation and forest degradation, which are responsible today for something between one and one and a half billion metric tons of carbon or petagrams each year. Largely that's in tropical countries and the deforestation is, is for agriculture. We, number two, we can allow forests to grow. Most forests are, are growing, are young, because they've been disturbed by humans, they've been harvested, or, or, they, or they're regrowing following agricultural abandonment or something of that sort. There are many forests out there taking up carbon. We could just let that continue. And we can expand the area of forests. <clears throat> plant forests or let them grow back where they have been in the past, but where they are now not being used for agriculture. But the question is, are they degraded lands? What are they being used for? Let me speak a little bit more about each of those. Stopping deforestation and forest degradation is not really got anything to do with negative emissions. It's just reducing current emissions from, like I say, one to one and a half petagrams to zero if we were completely successful at stopping. Um, but it's interesting if you think of one or one and a half petagrams of carbon, that's a that's a tiny number. It's a it's 10 to 15 percent of the fossil fuel emissions. So it's hard to imagine doing anything with land which will, will help much. But it's important to recognize that 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 emission of one to one and a half petagrams of carbon is really a net. And it's composed of gross emissions, which could be as high as five and a half petagrams of carbon, offset or balanced, if you will, by gross removals of four or four and a half. And the gross, the gross emissions result from burning of biomass, from decay of soil organic matter, from the losses of carbon through fire and as a result of management. So it's a it's a big number. The gross removals are largely from growth of forests. It's increases in biomass as forests grow, and and recovery of soil carbon too. So the point the 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 point here is that if we're if we're going to manage land, it's not that we can 
play with one to one and a half petagrams of carbon per year, we have much more to work with, something on the order of five petagrams of carbon, giving us a much bigger potential to have an effect on, on positive emissions as well as on the negative emissions. Um, that was, there was one other thing I wanted to say, but that will have to come back to me. Um, in theory, we could stop the five petagrams of carbon per year emitted, and, and the removals would continue because forests will continue to grow. They, they won't grow forever, but they will grow for decades, maybe even centuries. They'll continue to take carbon out of the atmosphere and put them in biomass. So it, we could stop the emissions pretty acutely, dr drastically, and, and for some time, have the continuing removals of carbon or negative emissions. And that's exactly what, what we need to do, to do it right away. All right, second, second option with respect to forests is let them grow. And as I said, forests are recovering from disturbances, both human caused and natural. Um, they're taking up on the order of four to four and a half petagrams of carbon per year. These are the negative emissions that that we require so much at present. Um, we we think that 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 four four and a half petagrams of carbon. Some of that's coming from forests growing after harvest of wood, about a, about a petagram, and then about three petagrams are coming from. Uh, we, we might call it shifting cultivation, but it's just rotational uses of land where where forests are cut down, used temporarily for agriculture until until either the soils lose their fertility or or, for, or people move on to another spot and the forests recover but they don't recover all the way before they're cleared again so there's a big cycling of land in shifting cultivation it won't be easy to convert shifting cultivation to permanent it won't be easy at all people have been working on how to do that how to keep soils fertile to to be able to produce crops annually it's worrisome because shifting cultivation is perhaps the only sustainable kind of agriculture in much of the tropics because of the soils so although it, it sounds like a good idea to have shifting cultivation more, more converted to permanent it, it will be difficult in some places and, it, and in fact it's already happening in, in many places because the, the fallow periods of the shifting cultivation are becoming shorter and lands are becoming more permanently cultivated. But the, the point is there's a, there's a large potential for letting forests to grow back and accumulate carbon. And if we eliminate it, as I said before, the emissions, the removals would continue. And, and finally, the third, third element of, of of uh, managing forests, and and the second that produces negative emissions is, is of course, to expand the area of forests. The estimates of how much land is available for that really vary by almost a factor of two, from 350 million to 678 million hectares. For comparison, that's about one third and two thirds of the entire area of the United States. Uh, now, the growth of new forests in these areas would remove something on the order of one and a half to two and a half petagrams of carbon over the next 30 years, and then it would continue to grow. But that's that's the uh, that's the size of, of the negative emissions that might come that are estimated to come from expanding forest area. And here, this just shows a quick summary of what I've been saying from the point of view of, of carbon budgets. On, on the left, let's look at the top today first. Fossil fuels are emitting about 10 billion metric tons. Land use, largely deforestation, largely degradation, is emitting about five and a half, but the sinks are taking up four out of those five and a half, the sinks in land and re recovering forests. There's, there's some reforestation, but not much to date. So the total comes to 11.5, and that's that's the total or the, the, 
the, the net emissions today. And what we could do if we eliminated the sources from deforestation and degradation, the 5.5 goes to zero. I'm talking now about the potential second, the, the lower, the lower graph. Uh, the land use sinks would continue for at least decades, if not longer. And, and we could reforest, let forests grow back in areas where they have been eliminated. So the total then comes to something like four instead of 11.5. So we've made big, have, potentially have a big effect. I should point out that these estimates for changes in land use, uh, the estimates of letting fallow forests grow back, letting harvests, stopping harvests are, are just technical potentials. They are, they are not, they don't bring into account whether people are willing to do that, how much it would cost to do it and so on, who owns the land. That's, that's another issue, but it's, it certainly means that it will be very hard to meet the technical potential and the question is what do we have? And I'll, I'll come back to that. I'll come back to some estimates that do include uh, more, something more likely to happen. Uh, let me show it, it, in, in some ways this represent, this is a repeat of the first graph I showed with all the lines on it, but this is a much simpler estimation. Here are the emissions from about 1850 to 2010, 2010 2015, where the, the green line shows the emissions from land use change. They've, they've always, they've been going on for, for centuries. On the black, sorry, the gray line is the emissions from fossil fuels, which you can see were, were actually less than those from land uh, until early in the, 19, in the 20th century. And the, the dark black is the total of those two, two net emissions. So if, I hope you can see this, there's a dotted line that comes down after 2015 down to, comes down very strikingly. That's that's the kind of reduction in fossil fuels that would be needed to meet a, a limit of two degree warming. And the question is, what can we do with land to, to help spread that out or to help in some way? And 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 here we show if you look at the green line, it drops, becomes negative, very high number negative for some decades, and then it forests have largely grown and they grow back at a lower rate. And that's that's the negative emissions that I'm talking about from letting forests grow and from um, expanding the area of forest. And you can see what that does for the the required emission reduction in fossil fuel emissions. That's the orange line. So the shaded area in there is the difference that land management made. And again the the, black, the darker line shows what the total emissions would be over time. And you can see uh, around 2050, a little bit before and, and up to 21, those emissions totally are negative, taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And, and we need that to um, limit the warming. All right, there are, there are numerous other possibilities other possible solutions. I'm going to mention four others because they get considerable attention. Uh, agriculture is responsible for not just carbon dioxide, but especially methane, methane from um, ruminants, cattle, sheep. Uh, nitrous oxide emissions are from largely fertilizer use of, of nitrogen. So there are ways of, of managing agriculture better to reduce those emissions. Wood products could be used as substitutes. For example, we could build buildings out of wood instead of steel and concrete, and the, and the energy requirements would be much less. Energy requirements pretty much equate with carbon emissions. So if we could use wood more, long-lasting wood products are a great way to take carbon are to, to preserve carbon on land, if you, if you were to harvest the forest, make the wood products last a long time, let the forest grow back, you actually could remove carbon from the atmosphere. The total amount of carbon on land is therefore in the forest and in the products, and that could be greater. 
That doesn't all happen much these days because most products don't last very long and the efficiencies are not very good. But in theory, one can substitute wood for energy and intensive materials and, and, and gain that way. Then next on the list is something called BEX, which I should explain. BEX is bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. Bioenergy is, is using wood for fuel, wood or grasses or something in the, and so that part that doesn't need the CCS, but the, the CCS is adds to this to make it look very appealing in the sense that it's both, what if you had a plantation of forest that you harvested every once in a while for wood that was used in energy. And when burning that, you actually captured the carbon dioxide out of the waste stream, out of the emissions, captured it and, and stored it, the S, carbon capture, and stored it underground in geological formations. Then as the plantation is growing back, you're accumulating carbon from the atmosphere and you haven't released it. So it's, it's ideal if it sounds too good to be true, it, it may be that it is too good to be true. I'll uh, come back to that in a minute. And then, and finally, I mentioned diets, which is different from the other things I've talked about, which are more supply side. Diets are demand side. If we decided we could eat less meat, we would free up a lot of area that is in pasture now, we could use it for something else. We would also not have one of the major methane emitters, which are the animals that are yeah, growing on pastures. Um, here are some estimates that came out of a recent paper by Rowe et al. about how much might be um, reduced in terms of emissions or, or serve as negative emissions. And, and you can see that BEX, this bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, has a goes pretty high. Um, that's uh, it, it. As I say, it has a great potential. The problems are several, however. One being that where the energy where the energy is used may not correspond well geographically with where the storage sites are. So there has to be some transportation. Um, worse than that, uh, large to make a difference, there'd have to be large areas of land that were just used for fuel for biofuels and. And as you, you can get a sense, I haven't talked about it, but there's a competition for land. If land is clearly needed for agriculture, it fits, if we're gonna use it for carbon storage as well, and then for fuel, we are starting to get, run, in, run into a land crunch, which is already happening in some places. And diets, it's, there's a clear downside of, of, of that. Um, so, I, as I say, the solutions all have drawbacks um, and deforestation is and degradation are not just going on because it's fun to do. They're going on for deforestation is generally producing new agricultural land. Degradation is, we call it degradation. We're, when a forest is harvested for wood, the, the the amount of carbon in the forest goes down, of course, as you take out carbon, and 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 I'm calling that degradation. Although the management may be sustainable, I'm just calling it degradation because the storage of carbon in a logged forest will be less than in an intact. Forest. So there are real downsides to ending deforestation, not expanding agricultural land, and not producing any more wood products. Letting forests grow, um, again, it's another use of, of land, competition for land, and how much land do we need in forests? I would argue quite a bit, but that's, that, that's, that's a question that has to be asked, answered. Um, expanding the area of forests is harder. It's, it's one thing to point to lands to a, try to inventory lands that are so-called unused. Uh, or or um, unfertile, or they've been used and they no longer are. But do you have to wonder if they were fertile, how they would be how they would be used besides additional forests? We talked about the agricultural emissions 
BECs, I've already mentioned what the downsides of that are. And, and in fact, I should say BECs is sort of, is experimental now. It would take considerable time to get it up and operational worldwide or in major areas for energy. So it's not a, it, despite its appeal, it's not gonna happen very quickly. And using once wood products as substitutes for steel and cement, for example, sounds good, but it has, uh, it contradicts letting forests grow. So there, there are lots of trade-offs here. Um, <clears throat> overall, there was a recent paper that I th think is the best estimate so far that, that by using land, we might, they could deliver Management might deliver something on the average, average of four petagrams of carbon per year by 2050. And that, that would meet about 30% of the total reduction in emissions needed. So we're talking about land having an effect, land management having an effect, it's about 30%. And, and, and these estimates took into account costs and tried to to come up with with reasonable as opposed to just technical potential. Um, let me move to conclusions now. Um, first of all, it should be clear that land management alone isn't going to solve the climate crisis. But it's also true, I think, that any real solution must include the management of carbon on land. So it's it's um, it's essential, but it's necessary, but not sufficient. Using land is necessary, but it won't be sufficient to solve climate problems. Fossil fuels in the end have to be transitioned. And in fact, not in the end, they have to be transitioned quickly. And on one more set of conclusions, a little less technical. I wanted to make the point that it's not too late um, to maybe, very difficult to stop warming at 1.5 since we've already had a warming of one and it's it's bound to continue, but it's not too late to, to avoid a two degree warming. Whether that's enough or not, I don't know, so we have to pay attention. If people ask me whether I'm optimistic or pessimistic, I, I've stayed away from both of those and use the term hopeful. Hopeful because there are solutions that we could implement. I had mentioned in particular ending deforestation and degradation, forest degradation, letting forests grow and taking carbon out of the atmosphere that way and expanding the area in forests. And we need, we need to, I think, coming back to the unimaginable, I flip that over and say, we need to make the unimaginable happen. We need to live without fossil fuels, learn to live without fossil fuels, live sustainably and live peacefully. And that's where I would stop. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Houghton. Uh, we appreciate very much your very clear presentation uh, that shows exactly uh, the interventions that can help mitigate this climate change crisis. I would now like to turn the time over to Kate Seaman, who will take us through the question and answer period. Thank you, Hoda. So for everybody attending, we have on the right hand side of the screen, there is a question and answer box. So if you have questions you would like to ask Professor Houghton, please type them in the box and then I will uh, moderate the questions for now. Um, and I'd also like to thank Professor Houghton for his very, very detailed presentation um, and also sticking to time. I didn't even have to give you your warning. So. Sure. Um, yeah. So do we have questions? Stop sharing. Let me do that. Perfect. So while I give the attendees time to think of questions, I actually had a question. Um, you were talking about land management and, and forest management, and I was wondering what the impact is of some of the large scale forest fires that we've been seeing recently. I'm thinking of the ones in California as a prime example, but how does that impact? Um, no, good question. Um, it, I, I think of it as, I mean, it's 
clearly related to management, but it's more of a of an indirect. Effect. In other words, few fires are really deliberate, especially the, the kinds you're referring to. They've been in Australia, they've been in um, in the Amazon, they're in California, in this country, and those those unfortunately eat into what I think of as the allowable emissions. They're they're sort of not. They're not already captured in them because they're sort of beyond the normal, and that's that's one of the, one of the worries. That and the thawing of permafrost are the two biggest examples of things that can work in the wrong direction. I, I should let, let me just say that there are also natural or indirect effects that are taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. The oceans are doing it, and land is doing it. We don't understand it thoroughly but the point is that nature has been working on our side and keeping about half of what we emit from staying in the atmosphere so that's great news unfortunately we don't know that it will continue so that's that's another reason to for urgency to make the switch thank you great um and then we have a question from the audience um about having related the problem of climate change to the issue of carbon dioxide emissions, how would you also respond to the point made by, and I'm probably going to pronounce this name wrong, Fogo Peak or Pielk, that there are a diversity of human influences on the climate system? Uh, no, that's that's quite true. It's um, no, it's Dr. Pelkey, I think. And um, Thank you. <laughs> that's who is being cited. Uh, no, that's for sure. And I've focused largely on the what you might call the biogeochemical, um, in the sense that it has to do with the greenhouse gases. But land is also does affects climate, and climate affects land through biophysics, which has more to do with the energy balance at, at the surface, it has to do with heating and evaporation and so on. So that there's an interaction between the biophysical and the biogeochemical. Uh, they sort of work together in the tropics. So what you do for one works for the other. They don't necessarily work. They work almost oppositely in boreal forests, high northern forests, where if you were to plant lots of forests in high latitudes, you might actually warm the earth because forests absorb, absorb heat. So I, and undoubtedly humans are, uh, as I say, doing doing other things to modify the Earth's surface. Uh, some are taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Some of the things they do are releasing it. But, so there, I should say there were two. <laughs> there were uh, last Sunday in the New York Times there were. A brief reviews of three books that have come out recently on what to do about climate change. Uh, according to the reviewer, there's lots of room for more more books to do a better job, but it's getting a lot of attention. And in in a half an hour, I I can't do much better. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we have another question from the audience about what our world would look like if we did cut our emissions. So what would we need to have in reduction of the number of cars, trucks, boats, airplanes, for example, in order to, to drastically cut emissions? Um, so how would we change how we live? Yeah, good example. I, I, I sometimes think we have to go through the eye of the needle in a sense that once, once we've transitioned to a renewable uh, to renewable sources of energy, we will again ha have well, we will have transportation, but it will be based on s so somehow solar creating fuel, which is either making a hydrogen, breaking water into hydrogen or methane or something of that sort, uh, driven by solar rather than fossil fuels. So I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I'm, I'm. I'm thinking the hard part is going from where we are now to uh, a more renewable-based energy form. But I think once there, <clears throat> uh, life—I hate to—I mean, it's hard. I can't imagine it won't be different. But uh, 
one example I think of is that the building where I work in was 10 or 15 years old, but we designed it to be neutral with respect to with respect to energy use. So it had a wind turbine there and has solar. And the, re the reason we could make ourselves neutral with respect to carbon and energy is because we reduced greatly because of the design of the building, the uh, need for energy. So I, I think that's a part of the deal that I haven't talked about, but as well as a transition, we have to be just smarter in the way we use it, more efficient. That's great. And I think um, Professor Mahmoudi has a question, but she's gonna pop back in and ask it. Okay, great. Yes, I do. Uh, Professor, I was wondering what measures can individuals take into consideration in order to mitigate climate change? Likewise, what is the role of corporations or big business in uh, cutting emissions? Thank you. Wow. Um, it, well, individuals can can do things at all scales. I mean, not just the way they use transportation, heat their houses and so on, but it's, um, but uh, just think about everything, everything you do, everything you buy is, re is making a vote for that way of living. So you sort of have to rethink what, what it is you're investing in. Um, and that, that includes not, not just regular shopping, but it also includes um, what, we what our endowments of various places are made of and, and so i i think i mean i think the economic argument has been made that fossil fuels are not, are no longer a good investment they are receiving huge subsidies at present but that seems to me to be fairly misguided that in fact these assets will be stranded they will not be able to be used so it's so the wise oil companies are really thinking themselves as energy companies and i'm sure they're thinking of thinking about sustainable ways that are not fossil based um in terms of corporations i worry that that the focus there of course is on making money and i'm not sure that works with making a sustainable and well crazy, sustainable, peaceful, equitable earth. I, I worry about when land becomes a commodity or carbon becomes a commodity, the question is what, what happens to the people who don't have power? Is, uh, it, is it priced out of their existence? And there's, there's certainly lots of examples of that. So I, that's, I haven't touched on that, but that's, that's my worry when it when when the world really takes climate change seriously and starts to put a price on carbon um i i w would like to see that done carefully so that all the constituents are have have a voice thank you great so we have a few more minutes if there are more questions from other attendees i'll wait if a few minutes and see if there are any. Um, but while we wait, I also then had a follow up question actually. Um, so you mentioned the building that you work in and how that was made um, carbon neutral. And this also ties back to your last comment on uh, equity as well. So thinking about the question of climate appropriate construction, um, is that something that we should be thinking about? Um, and how does that then feed into issues of equity if we think of land use and and those kind of questions? Um, so I'm thinking of uh, how in the past humans have built appropriate to the climate. So if you think of Mediterranean villages where everything is whitewashed to keep mm. the heat out as an example, um, and should we be perhaps looking back to those examples? Mm. Yeah, um, well, I mean, it, it's already, I mean, there are LEED certifications, so people recognize the importance. I'm not sure how much it's trickled down to local place, how much the builders, there, some builders are very much aware, others are still sort of doing what they would have been taught to do. Uh, but to write what different building materials, um, 
the you know there are lots of things you learn in in schools in terms of buildings and it needs to be fundamentally looked at with respect to what's the best way to to provide heat um i, I for example heat and light those are ways i i just the other thing that comes to mind is is i visit in in russia in the countryside they often have two cathedrals in a in a village one for winter and one for summer and they're they're as you might imagine totally different the, the big and light and airy versus compact and and well heated so it's 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 almost as though um when we had to use fuels that were hard to come by we were more careful in the past of how how we did that and it seems like it's even more so needed in the future i don't know if that got at your question but it sort of rambled around <clears throat> that was great thank you um so i have a question here from the audience about um, the impact of the military industrial complex, I think. So the war industry, do we have any estimates of the reductions in carbon emissions if the war industry was reduced? I, I don't know of any. I know that, um, I know that some of our military outposts uh, don't want to have to rely on fossil fuels just because of the remoteness and the difficulty and challenges ahead so that i there so the military is certainly thinking about how to how to s sustain uh groups without importing oil so um and and i know i know the military thinks about the the social particularly uh, political effects of climate change in terms of instability, just pe making people more, uh, what, what, more leading to more conflicts when resources. Uh, I think the warming often will make uh, agricultural production dip and, and that by itself, not to mention water are, are big sources, of potential uh, conflict. So that's, and I, and I think the military is, Aware of that, thinking about it, to them, it's 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 a it's a real concern. Great. Um, I have another question from the audience. Um, as an experienced researcher with a view of the past and the future, what are the most important understandings you would hope the next generation would have about the land and climate change? Oh boy, what a what a nice question. I uh, I think. Looking back, look how long it's taken for climate change, or even carbon, to enter the vocabulary. I mean, we uh, it was in 1992 that the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, got started. The, that and you know it's been in whatever 28 years since then. We haven't done much, but but the conversation's different. And so what I I, I think the next for for me the next step and it out there yet is to recognize what land oceans what nature i don't i don't necessarily mean natural system any human but the point is that living things do a lot to help make the planet inhabitable for us and no almost no one pays much attention to that and climate's a good example i mean because of the carbon stored in soils and in vegetation the whole climate system is based on biophysics biogeochemistry and, and and life without life it would be a different planet indeed so i th i think the general recognition of how what how big a role living things play in the functioning of the planet needs a little a better understanding at, you know as we've grown in awareness of climate this as i say this is what i think the next issue is thank you for that <laughs> thank you uh, a few minutes left if there are any more questions 
here and interject. Okay, uh, Dr. Houghton, I was wondering, uh, you mentioned forests and the importance of giving them a rest and having them regenerate. Um, what do you say about um, tree planting in general? Uh, not just in forests, but uh, yeah. in other parts of, of the communities and in, in the world, etc. No, no, good question. Yeah. I mean, there, are sort of, there are two answers I think of. One is that if, in terms of forests, <clears throat> first, uh, if, if, if they are planted or, or tended to, you can, you can get a much quicker response than just natural regeneration. So there's that to think about. But then, uh, and the other question of not forests, but trees outside of forests, you think particularly, I mean, everywhere, uh, whether it's urban or not, um, trees trees are very helpful in urban environments just by, by providing shade and some cooling aspects and as well as removing ozone from the air doing a certain amount of air clarification um, and and trees of course provide much fuel in 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 certain parts of the country so uh, if and 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 the people are aware that if you cut down your tree, you're that's sort of it for getting fuel. So so to the extent it's possible, those are lopped or managed uh, carefully. But I no, I think I mentioned forests because of of the quantities of carbon involved. It's really it's hard by with individual trees. But on the other hand, trees can have double effect in cities both I say from the local environmental flex plus the carbon i don't know if i did that justice but i th I, th I think f we don't we don't all need to have a forest in the backyard but trees would be good another question um policy wise what do you think are actions that it is necessary for us to take in the us so what policies would you like to see the U.S. government pass to deal with climate change. Well, uh, uh, I um, sorts of incentives, uh, but, but well, positive and negative regulations and incentives to hasten this transition, as I say, from fossil to renewables, which would mean doing some in, more investing in the renewables, taking away the subsidies to the fossil fuels, uh, exploring other, other ways. To some extent, there, there are research efforts to, um, not using trees or plants to take CO2 out of the atmosphere. That's worthy of pursuit. I just don't think it's going to happen fast enough. And, and I worry that, that the energy costs are I make this just doesn't work. But um, so I, I also I don't want to end by saying what we need is more research. I think we I think we need some uh, strong leadership on climate change that says here here are the important things. Here's what we shouldn't be investing in. Here are the things we should be investing in. And and I and I think in, in laying down some incentives so that people actually work that way. Uh, um, yeah, I, and yeah, and yeah, again, you have to do that carefully. Uh, Americans don't like to be told what they have to do, but on the other hand, we do pay taxes for various services, and and so I, I think you have to be careful. Let's say, in, if if you were to come up with a carbon tax, it has to be fair and it has to generate income, additional income for those that that can't afford it. So. You, you can't just just have a, a carbon tax period. You have to think about where the where the revenues go. So we do still have a couple. Of, um, I just have one more question, Dr. Houghton. Your talk has been so interesting that I keep you know questions keep coming up. So uh, my question really has to do with uh, your perception, in your opinion, uh, how are we doing in terms of uh, 
really getting the nations of the world, the leaders of the world, problems, but, but there are also some good things maybe going on. What can you tell us in terms of, in your opinion, uh, what is happening with more collaboration and cooperation among the leaders and governments of the world? Mm -hmm. It's 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 not something I know a lot about. I I I like working with the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, because that focuses on trying to get representatives from all countries involved. Um, it does it just goes out of its way to, to try to do that. And there's no question we need international cooperation to deal with climate change. Um, uh, the UN, the 1992 convention beginning, and we have annual agreement meetings on that. Uh, so, so on the one hand, international cooperation is is happening and it's really important. Uh, on the other hand, in some countries where governments are not taking particularly aggressive stance it's uh it it, it can, cities cities sometimes interact with cities in other countries uh, states can take you know and individuals and and corporations companies can can take stands and do things it's just that the government can make that easier to happen by putting in the incentives and then but internationally i i i I mean, there there is lots of collaborate cooperation collaboration, um, but but nationalism is still a big deal. So I, you know, in you, you sort of have to start thinking globally. Not that I need a global environment. Not that I'm promoting that. But but one one is. Climate is not something that recognizes borders or recognizes whether you want it or not. It's it's on its way. So let's um let's let's look for places where we share common interests globally and, and work on those. That actually just covered one of the other questions that I got in the question and answer box. But I have one more um which will probably make the last one. Um, so there's a question that says COVID-19 has caused at least a temporary um, clean air effect in big cities. We're seeing this in Los Angeles, in New York, um, in I think Delhi, there's been examples of this um, mm -hmm. in China too. Um, so is there a window of opportunity here to perhaps understand and reevaluate our priorities in terms of consumer demands and the impacts that we have on the environment? Oh yeah, def definitely. Uh I mentioned that I, I think it's if you look at it as an opportunity besides a, a disaster. Um, I mean, as I said, it the emissions are definitely coming down globally. They will be much lower than last year, and and that's not. I mean, it's not happening for the right reason, but it's but people are becoming by necessity more in, ingenious and and more conservative of their resources so all of that should should be um you know provide lessons what to what works um so i i i think of this as you know not a not a good event but it's an opportunity to learn and it's and it is curtailing the use of uh, fossil fuels for sure um I think we'll see a dip, and as I said, most dips have we've recovered from in the past. So we should be. I'm hoping we can use this uh, educational period as a time to, to take climate change more seriously. Obviously, we're dealing primarily now with with the virus issue, but the point is, what we're doing in response to that may carry over to what needs to be done for climate question. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, Professor Marudi, we have a few five minutes left. So I think if we stop stop there, that gives us time to to transfer over to the next speaker. But thank you again, Professor Houghton. That was really interesting. And thank you for yeah. 
taking the time to engage with the questions as well. You're very welcome. My pleasure. <laughs>